afternoon. My name is Jennifer Wistran, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute. Thank you for joining us for a discussion of, is Russia's influence in Central Asia in decline? Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to remind you that you can stay up to date on the Kennan Institute's activities by visiting the Kennan Institute's website and subscribing to our blogs and podcasts and other publications. I would also like to thank the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs for co-sponsoring today's event. Today's speakers are Edward Lemon, Teresa sabonis Help, Timur Umarov, and Kasiat Ismanova. Edward Lemon is an assistant research professor at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University in Washington, DC. He's also the president of the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs and a global fellow with the Kennan Institute. Teresa Savonis Help is a professor of the practice in Georgetown University's School of Foreign Services master's degree program. She's also the inaugural chair of the Science, Technology, and International Affairs concentration. Timur Umarov is a fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center in Berlin. His research focuses on Central Asian states' domestic and foreign policies, as well as China's relations with Russia and Central Asia. And finally, Kasia Dismanova is the Director of Central Asia Barometer, which does research design, data collection analysis for research projects throughout Central Asia. After our guests speak, there will be a question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your question via the Q&A function on Zoom. And please remember to include your name and affiliation when doing so. Finally, today's discussion is being recorded. So as was mentioned in the invite for this event, we're gonna focus on Russia vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia from security, political, economic, and social perspectives. And to that end, I'm gonna ask each of my participants here a couple of questions related to that before we open up the floor for the general audience. So my first question I'll direct to Edward. Um, in what ways has Russia played a role in Central Asia's security, and how has this changed in recent years? Many people long considered Russia to be the principal security, external security player in the region. It has military facilities in three of the five countries, in Kazakhstan, in Tajikistan, and in the Kyrgyz Republic. It has extensive military ties, particularly to those three countries. Over time, over the past 32 years, it's made up something like two thirds of the arms exports to the region, including over 90% of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan's arms imports, making, of course, those militaries heavily reliant on Russian equipment, Russian expertise, um, Russian training, Russian border guards were stationed on the Tajik-Afghan border until 2004. Um, and there have been extensive military exercises through the various bilateral contacts that Russia has and through the Collective Security Treaty Organization um, and through the Collective Commonwealth of Independent States. Um, those three states, um, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and, and Kyrgyzstan, all members of the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And so Russia has long been a, a major player in in the security of the region, also through more um, informal and formal ties via security services. Um, and so, you know, all of the security services of the region uh, emerged from the collective KGB, and those ties have remained very strong, facilitating things like transnational repression of um, Central Asian dissidents, migrants, exiles in Russia. And so it's a multifaceted series of security linkages um, that I think um, have remained relatively strong, and we can discuss the ways in which Ukraine and the invasion of Ukraine has affected those ties. I think it's undermined them materially, and so far as Russia's withdrawn and drawn back some of its forces in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan in its two principal military bases in the region, and it's also symbolically, and so far as particularly in Kazakhstan has such a long border with Russia, the invasion of Ukraine has, of course, brought into question this supposed role of Russia as a security guarantor in the region. And so I think security um, remains an area where Russia is and remains the principal external partner, but I think that's now coming into question. And that was excellent in terms of an overview of the security situation. I want to maybe pick up on a point before 
we're turning to a political question for Timor, but but you mentioned uh, the the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the CSTO. So if we could just focus on that a little bit more. So as you mentioned, three of the five Central Asian states, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, they belong to the the CSTO, which is a NATO-like agreement in many respects. And you touched on this a little bit, but I want I'm wondering if you could say more. To what extent has this organization really actually provided a meaningful sense of security for its members? And has its efficacy waned in the 21 months since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine? And if so, do you think either in the immediate term, maybe medium or longer term, is that going to push the members to look elsewhere? I mean, we saw, uh, you know, Armenia also being a member of it, right? With with it not feeling that Russia upheld its obligations to it following the Karabakh situation, that it's, you know, looking elsewhere. Do you see something similar happening with the, the Central Asian states or no? CSTO has long criticized as being ineffective as a um, security as a security alliance for the Central Asian Republic in 2010. We saw ethnic violence in Kyrgyzstan, and we saw then interim president of Kyrgyzstan, Rosa Otunbayeva, calling on the CSTO to intervene. Um, but then they said this is a matter of internal security and, and doesn't constitute an area where the CSTO should um, play a role. We've seen violence between CSTO member states, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, particularly in recent years, with two rather serious border conflicts in April 2021 and September 2022. Again, the CSTO failed to intervene. The one significant intervention that it's made in the region was, of course, in the bloody January events of January 2022, when the Tokayev regime in, in Kazakhstan had lost um, control of parts of the country and there was widespread instability and protests, and the CSTO intervened through its peacekeeping um, forces to help stabilize that situation. But since then, in a, two months, within two months of that intervention, in early January 2022, of course, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began, and that's led again to question marks around the CSTO with multiple members, such as Armenia, um, uh, not attending meetings. We've seen Kyrgyzstan cancel an exercise in fall of 2022, and certainly we've seen question marks around whether this is genuinely an organization that provides security or whether it's merely an alliance through which Russia tries, as it is in the entire region, to hold the region under its influence and, part, and frame it as part of its near abroad. So certainly I think we've seen um, declining expectations from the Central Asian republics to the extent those even ever existed about what the CSTO can really um, do for the uh, for, for security, for even for regime security in the region. And we've seen, as you alluded to, the uh, search for alternatives, increasingly reliance on Turkey in terms of the provision of drones that have become obviously very important in the wake of various border conflicts in the region. And even uh, the Kazakh foreign minister saying that during the bloody January events, they would have entertained the prospect of Chinese intervention, but there was no uh, mechanism through which they could um, the legal mechanism through which China could intervene. And so I think there certainly is a search for alternative partners um, in terms of security. Excellent. Thank you. And you, you raised, uh, again, raising these broader Turkey, China. I think these are points we can visit later on as well. To what extent are they going to supplant Russia or is it a completely different situation? I want to turn to Timor ask a question, you know, what are Russia's political interests in Central Asia and what specifically is it seeking from the various Central Asian governments? First of all, thank you for having me. Um, moving on to the Russia's political interests in the region, I would say that there are um, three main broad interests that um, exist uh, in in at least in the current political leadership in Russia when it comes to their um, policies in Central Asia. First of all, um, I think uh, Russia's focus in its foreign policy was always um, something else, but not Central Asia. Central Asia was not um, something that the Kremlin really cared about um, or spent a lot of resources and energy on strategic thinking um, about its presence in the region. And that is why um, Central Asia was always um, um, kind of um, the region that Russia used to prove that Russia is a great power, um, especially when it comes to Russia's relationship with the West. Um, Russia wanted to be like 
the U.S. And for that, it needed uh, territories, countries where it is considered to be a dominated power. And uh, Central Asia was used by Moscow all the time um, for this particular re reason. And that is why um, um, you, um, that is why Moscow has been um, kind of pushing Central Asian countries to join its integration projects so that it will have the same formats as other great powers have, uh, whether it's Eurasian Economic Union or Collective Security Treaty Organization, something like NATO, right? Um, um, Russia used Central Asia specifically for that. Uh, but um, additionally to that, um, I would say that for Russia, it was um, also important um, to have countries that will support um, its foreign policy direction. Um, and if not support, but mm, not to criticize Russia for uh, what it's doing with the, um, its neighbors. And here, um, I think Central Asia is uh, playing a very important role. And we see how uh, Central Asian countries are keeping this role even uh, during the war in Ukraine and how no one, no country from Central Asian country uh, didn't criticize openly at least uh, what Moscow is doing against uh, Ukraine for already almost two years. Um, and the third um, uh, political direction or political interest of Moscow in um, Central Asia, um, I think uh, the most important one for um, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, or the current political regime is um, um, they wanted Central Asia to put their development, to put their time on pause. They wanted um, Central Asia um, um, to have um, to continue to exist as a region where um, Russia is a dominant power and um, uh, to um, uh, somehow be an example for uh, the political leadership of Russia that this region really exists where Russia um, still is very important and considered to be a great power. Um, and uh, because of that, we see that um, Russia may not be so much um, um, you know, jealous about Central Asian countries being economically cooperating with the West, but when it comes to cooperation um, on uh, language, when it comes to questions of, of national identity, these are the questions that matter the most for um, Moscow in its foreign policy uh, di direction towards Central Asia. Um, if Central Asian countries are, for example, talking about reforms of their alphabets and moving away from Cyrillic letters to Latin. Uh, this is a question that Russian MFA brought up during the press conferences and says that um, it's uh, something that shouldn't be happening. Um, or um, if Central Asian countries are um, cooperating on language courses with the Western countries, this is also something that Moscow doesn't like. And um, uh, recently, for example, the uh, State Duma deputy, um, Mr. Tolstoy, was uh, complaining that uh, Central Asia is moving away from Russian language to English. Um, and uh, this is something that Moscow should react to. So um, I would say those three political um, interests are still keeping um, Russia attached to Central Asia. That was fantastic, Timur. I really like how you broke that down into the three parts and specifically looking at the last language, national identity. We tend to assume everything can be reduced to national security, geostrategic, economic. And as you underscored, no, in the case of Russia, that language, national identity, that's a big motivating factor. So that was excellent. Uh, Teresa, I want to turn to you um, and ask you, how does energy play a role in Russia's economic relations with Central Asia? So to Timur's point about Russia essentially trying to keep Central Asia sufficiently underdeveloped so that it can retain a role, um, Russia can claim some successes. Um, there was a moment of great European interest in building new pipeline routes. Uh, there was a moment early in the war where Russia becoming whimsical with flow throughs of the Caspian pipeline consortium pipelines uh, caused uh, 
Kazakhstan to re-examine feasibility. But because of the time delay, uh, the window really is beginning to close, I think. Um, first of all, one of the ways Europe has dealt with the unimaginable prices last year is there's been a fair amount of demand destruction. Europe is, is becoming more efficient. It's using less energy. It's losing faith in overland gas pipelines um, airing on the side of liquid natural gas, which has higher economic risk, but lower political risk. So just by slowing things to some extent, uh, Russia has succeeded. And one component of that, by the way, is that because the Caspian is landlocked in the way that it is, without cooperation of equipment flowing down through Russian rivers, it's impossible to get the material that is needed for a large infrastructure project. And this has repeatedly been a vulnerability uh, for Central Asia. There's one more thing that happened in and I think those who are not in the energy industry don't think about it very much, but um, the Nord Stream 2 explosion um, cast a whole lot of doubt on how the industry used to think about risk. Laying a natural gas pipeline um, is more difficult, but once you lay it, it's on the seabed, so the pressure is constant, weather affects it less, and it was generally thought that undersea pipelines were sort of favorable. But the fact that it was possible to destroy Nord Stream 2 and that attribution remains problematic so much longer after the after the fact raises a whole new set of concerns about risks, um, raises a whole new set of concerns about how would you safeguard it if you did build it. And so with all those things in mind, the timeline being problematic, um, the need for some Russian buy-in to get equipment in, and new fears that raise the risk premium, pre all of those have contributed to make less plausible a westward direction for new Central Asian oil and gas. But the other thing that's happened in energy that is the most important right now and that we still see how Russia's role is unfolding has to do with uranium. Um, Kazakhstan is the producer of over 40% of all the world's uranium. It is the largest producer of uranium. But Kazakhstan does not have uh, refining capability, uh, it does not build fuel rods. China engaged two years ago, a little more than two years ago, the facility was completed in December of last year to do some components of that, but still um, Kazakh uranium goes to Russia and much of the processing takes place in Russia. And then it comes back and a small percentage of it, Kazakhstan bundles, uh, does part of the supply chain to build into fuel rods. There's huge interest in more of that, but there's a legal challenge. And that is cooperating with a nation that does not have nuclear power in a sector that could lead to nuclear weapons is hugely legally problematic. So how do we move forward with that? Um, there's not a clear answer yet. China's doing some things because it wants to expand the existing facility and what that facility can do. And uh, the French president Macron's visit to um, Kazakhstan was in no small part to discuss that issue. There's a lot of possibility that Kazakhstan will build one or two small reactors, not because nuclear inherently makes a huge amount of sense right now for Kazakhstan, but because it would create a completely different political legal environment for uh, refining. And that's a market that Kazakhstan wants. Uzbekistan also covets. And the West is really looking for new pa partners in that area. So that I would say in energy, Russia kind of won in oil and gas to some extent, um, but the jury is still out on what role and to what extent Central Asia will change Russia's role in, in uranium. Uh, Teresa, that's fascinating, and specifically that last part about the uranium and the markets. Uh, and I want to ask a following question, which maybe isn't fair, asking, putting you on the spot, but to what extent do you, you know, in the wake of, you know, the October 7, Israel Hamas situation and kind of initial reactions to what could be done to oil and gas markets worldwide. Do you think that's going to have any bearing on Russia vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia? What's going on there? Or is that just going to stay the course in there? Do you, how do you see energy there being impacted if you do? And again, I realize that's not necessarily a fair question to ask since it's a more current event. No, that that's a, it's a really interesting question. The fear premium, whenever the market anticipates that something major is going to happen, the fear premium tends to drive up um, energy very dramatically, particularly oil. The oil market is still more volatile, more immediately volatile than gas. Um, the world market no longer thinks about the Russo-Ukraine war as a major factor 
in, in oil and gas. Um, that may be misplaced, but that is what it is. If in the new unfolding war in the Middle East, there is something that interrupts supply of either gas or oil, where it becomes clear that gas or oil supply is a target in the war, then that will create a price spiral. Every time we see a price spiral upward, countries like Kazakhstan are gonna reconsider. Is the risk of these undersea pipelines uh, worth moving forward? Can we still get enough support from Europe to do it? Um, so the price will go up um, if something is damaged. But what's very different this year from last year is that this year, Europe arrives at winter with unprecedented stores. They never used to have storage on the level that they do. That is, by definition, going to dampen the markets in gas. And the oil the oil storage has also been restored um, all over the world to brace for this winter. So we're not in as precarious a position as we were last year, even though there are there's potential uh, war related interruptions in more than one location. Thank you. This is uh, no, thank you. It's fascinating. I, I like the fact that you hooked on the word perception because I do think perception oftentimes is what drives a lot of change. And that's going to be my segue to asking Cassiata a question. But before I do so, I want to remind our audience in about 10, 12 minutes or so, we'll open it up for audience questions. So if you do have questions, please do send them in via the the, uh, the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, and, and once we have a sufficient number of pop questions that are populated, I'll start to ask those as well. But picking up on that idea of perceptions, um, being a driver, Cassiat, I'd like to ask you, um, what are Central Asian's perceptions of Russia? And, and have those perceptions changed since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks uh, a lot for having me as well. Um, I think um, diving uh, right to the question of the, pa uh, of the panel, if the Russia's influence is, is in decline, I think that the public opinion data that uh, Central Asia Barometer gathers from 2017 clearly shows that it is in decline, actually. Let me give you some numbers. I'm, I hope that you will not be bored by them. Uh, uh, just to illustrate this, so in Kazakhstan, if uh, in 2017, 50% uh, of the population was very favorable of Russia, in our recent poll in spring 2023, it was only 17%. And we also see that the negative attitude towards Russia uh, rose from 6% to 33% in Kazakhstan. The Moscow survey that is also conducted in Kazakhstan, it, uh, it there were two waves of it. It also shows that 50% of the population um, reported that their attitude towards Russia has worsened. This was a direct question asked from them. So in KG, we see a less dramatic decline, but still very um, important from 65% to 45%. In Uzbekistan, from 55% to 70%. Uh, in Turkmenistan, we see uh, that the um, negative sentiment rose from 4% to 15%. In Tajikistan, we cannot ask this question as it's very sensitive, but we see a major dramatic drop in um, Tajikistan's views of uh, good destination for labor migration. It dropped from 90% to 30% in a period of one wave after this, after the February 2022. When it comes to other countries, the drop was around 15 to 20%. So Russia has dropped a lot in terms of the um, uh, favorable destination uh, for labor migration. And also the, this decline, I think, uh, in the data shows it, it was gradual, but um, more sharp uh, drops happened after the February 2022. And recently, we had a think tank forum in Astana where all Central Asian think tanks gathered, and we were discussing why Ukraine triggered all this um, decolonization uh, movement in Central Asia. And we um, uh, agreed that the prospect of recolonization has actually sparked all this negative sentiment on grassroots and also expert um, communities. Um, when it comes to the war, we see that majorities in all countries, they follow the news about the war around 60 to 70 percent. But uh, we see more of ambiguity than polarization. 
when it comes to the attitudes of the respondents towards the war, because around 30 to 40 percent, they um, answer don't know when asked about direct war related questions, which may actually signal about the sensitivity of the survey question, but also that these people cannot locate them in this conflict and they're quite uh, that they're quite that the conflict is quite ambiguous to them. Also, during the focus groups, uh, we when we asked questions uh, about the war, people were mostly referring to the conflict that it tam is sam yes pravda, meaning that there is truth there and here. So we need to think about our our own interests. And when we asked um, our respondents what stance should their country take on the conflict, the majority is answered that it should be neutrality. Uh, but we also see a lot of alarmism and concerns about the conflict. People are concerned about negative consequences on their economy rather than security. Uh, around 20% are concerned about the war coming to their country or the country joining the war. Uh, in Kazakhstan, we see a concern about refugees. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, we see concern about labor migrants in Russia. Um, and when uh, talking about taking sides uh, on this conflict, we need to uh, take into account the narrative narrative that we have that uh, this is not a war of Russia and Ukraine, it's a war of uh, Russia and the US. But still we uh, asked people um, wh whom to blame in, uh, during this conflict. And in Kazakhstan, we see more support towards Ukraine and less support to Russia. Uh, in KG, it is vice versa. and. When asked why do you support Russia, people mostly refer to pragmatic uh, reasons rather than ideological reasons. People name such reasons like economic uh, dependency or energy dependency, as Theresa uh, well mentioned about it. Um, so we see a lot of things happening on the ground and many more research should be done on this. And taking into account that around 50 to 60 percent of Central Asian population uh, consumes Russian media, mm, it can be news or um, entertainment content. Uh, we see that a lot of things are going there, and I will be happy to discuss it later during the Q&A session. Thank you, Kasia. That was fantastic in terms of outlining the different perceptions and the data points that you had too. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we're gonna, in about five minutes, shift to, we've got a number of questions that have come in. I wanna try and get through one more question for each person quickly. So maybe shorter answers this time around. Um, but Ed, my question is gonna go to you and it's gonna build on a comment. You know, Timur made the comment, um, Central Asia, the region is used to being, basically it knows that it's, Kind of Russia's proving ground, right? For for demonstrating it's a great power and building on and Kasia's statement then showing, but at the same time we see a negative sentiment increasing, right, among Central Asians towards Russia. So looking through the security lens, to what extent does Russia really have the ability to quote kind of threaten or coerce the Central Asian states when it comes to either national security issues, economic security, energy security, the host of things, all of which are areas in which Russia has exerted some degree of influence over the past three decades. I mean, do you see this transforming because of, again, um, especially some of the data points that Cassie has just laid out? I think you certainly do see concern, particularly in Kazakhstan, um, particularly with regards to certain Russian nationalists, including former President Dmitry Medvedev, who've made claims that parts of Kazakhstan were historically parts of Russia. So I think certainly it feeds into this perception that of recolonization, prospect of recolonization, which, which we guess yet mentioned, which I think is very important. I think in practice, I think it's it's um, with the extent to which Russia's bogged down in Ukraine means that it's difficult to imagine any kind of military intervention, at least at this point in Central Asia, but certainly I think it matters in so far as there's the perception of that possibility and this undermining of this idea and this discourse of Russia being some kind of security guarantor plays into, into perceptions. I think certainly Russia has um, in the past, you know, flexed its um, muscles, it's used 
military aid. It's used other development assistance, for example, to the Bakiev government to um, try and convince them to um, to uh, end terminate the contract uh, for the Manas Transit Center that was controlled by the United States from 9/11 up until 2014. So certainly Russia has shown an ability to use both carrots and sticks, like any great power in the region, um, when it wants to try and get its way. Excellent, thank you, uh, Timur. Turning to you for another political angle. But to what extent has Russia been perceived to be involved in domestic politics in Central Asia? And what kinds of leverage um, does it have? I think there are many examples of how Russia um, can, how, how the you know presence of Russia and influence of Russia in domestic politics in Central Asia can be traced. Um, first, it will be the direct an involvement into different um, domestic crises, as we've seen during Khandar, January 2022 in Kazakhstan, or during um, coup d'etats in Kyrgyzstan, or even smaller crises as the conflict between uh, two ex-presidents of Kyrgyzstan, um, Atambayev and Jenbekov, uh, um, or the, the the presence of Russia was also visible during the civil war in in, in Tajikistan. So this is the direct involvement. Um, um, another um, feature of Russia's involvement into domestic issues would be um, how Russia kind of participates in the process of uh, transition of power from um, one person to another. Uh, this was again visible during uh, events in Kyrgyzstan many times, uh, but also um, how Sardar Berdumuhamedov, before becoming president two years ago, uh, was visiting constantly Russia and um, meeting with different Russian um, high-ranking officials, uh, but also um, when the first president of Uzbekistan, um, Islam Karimov, uh, died, um, how Shavkat Mirziyoyev was also um, meeting with the Russian officials and how Vladimir Putin was, um, you know, talking to him during the funeral of um, Islam Karimov. Um, there are also, um, um, you know, uh, the effect of how uh, Central Asia's authoritarian regimes learn from um, Russian know-hows on how to control their societies or uh, control um, some of the um, spheres of um, civil um, actions. Uh, for example, Kyrgyzstan uh, is following Russia on the foreign agents law um, and uh, control over the media. We've seen some of the examples of um, how the same techniques as um, Russian security services use were implemented in Tajikistan or in Kyrgyzstan, um, or this whole um, idea about fighting against LGBT um, is being also portrayed, um, is being also seen in, in Uzbekistan um, or again in Kyrgyzstan. So I would say there are three um, these uh, kind of uh, attempt, um, techniques that um, Russia is ac um, accessing the domestic issues in Central Asia. Excellent. Thank you, Timur. Uh, we have 20 questions that have come in, which is excellent, but I want to ask quickly two very targeted questions to Teresa and then one follow on question to Kasiat, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, Teresa, my two quick questions for you. So you did an excellent job outlining the, the energy situation in Central Asia. One question I have, maybe so we can flesh out kind of the labor market and, and trading partnership relationships. So to what extent is Central Asia's labor force currently dependent on Russia's economy for jobs? Uh, I mean, Kasiat mentioned this a little bit about labor migrants. We know a large number of labor migrants have traditionally um, migrated up to Russia and back. But, you know, to what extent is that still the case? Have we seen a change since the, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine? And then my second part question, which Central Asian states have continued to maintain close trading partnerships with Russia and which have diversified elsewhere? And again, same thing has the, the Russian invasion, full-scale invasion of Ukraine at all impacted those trading partnerships. All right, sure. Well, um, given... Kasiat's observation about perceptions of Russia, it's a little bit extraordinary to say that uh, 
labor migration to Russia has continued to rise. But I want to put that in some better context. Um, first of all, uh, that is based on measuring remittance flows, and that's not entirely labor migrants, because when there's capital migration, that makes the data hard to parse. And then the second thing is, it was the first quarter of the war where we saw a lot of out migration. So when we compare it to right now, what are we looking at? Well, migration was um, down because of the early phase of the war, migration was down, had not yet recovered from COVID, and now it's beginning to go back. And, and I think what that shows is Central Asia, Central Asians are returning to a status quo ante, that there's a lot of demand for labor in Russia. The war no longer seems like it's going to be short. It seems like it's going to be protracted. So people are beginning to resume the patterns that they had before. But it's not just the status quo. The numbers themselves are at a five-year high in terms of the numbers of people going across. To your question about uh, dependence, in uh, last year, Uzbekistan was 21% reliant on remittances. Kyrgyzstan was 31% reliant, and this is as percentage of GDP. And Tajikistan was 51% reliant. These kind of, this kind of dependence on sending young men out um, hasn't changed. And so one of the things that's beginning to happen is, for example, the USAID has opened two consultation centers in Uzbekistan for labor migrants. Uzbekistan has been signing agreements with other countries on how to regularize migration. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Uzbekistan has been focused on the UK and Turkey, and to a lesser extent on the Middle East. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan has signed an agreement with South Korea. None of these will fully replace because all the other countries um, sort of need a higher level of skill and the language barriers are somewhat different. Um, but what we're seeing is migration and migrant labor remittances are going to remain critical. But where, where those people go is just beginning to change. <clears throat> And bear in mind, there's also the reverse migration. Um, estimates suggest that more than a million people left Russia in 2022, and they left in two waves. The first was right at the start of the war, and the second was right after the imposition of conscription. And when we look at where they moved, the four target countries are Kazakhstan, Turkey, Georgia, and Armenia. All of these are not in the EU, um, but they are adjacent to, um, to Russia. Another thing to keep in mind is there's a little bit of interesting hidden migration, because although countries like Tajikistan have a dual citizenship agreement with Russia so that Russia knows who has passports to both countries, Kyrgyzstan does not. And so we've seen a curious rise in Russians applying for passports in Kyrgyzstan, because you can hold a Kyrgyz passport without Russia knowing it. So there, there's strange little eddies and corners. Um, but to your point about um, trading partnerships, what we see is that everyone's trading still with Russia more than with each other than in the past. And the narrative of the middle quarter is stronger than the absolute evidence that you're getting transit of goods and services. Um, the one thing that I found most interesting to watch in this dynamic um, is really about grain. Uh, Russia had a bumper crop last year. And so, and at the same time, they were reducing exports uh, for political reasons because of the Black Sea grain agreement and so on. And um, they pushed a lot of grain into Kyrgyz into Kazakhstan, so much so that in an unprecedented move, Kazakhstan is at the end of, and I do believe they will lift it at the end of this month, but Kazakhstan is at the end of a six-month ban on Russian grain because the Russian grain was basically being dumped on the market and suppressing price. So all these countries are caught between the desire to build new trade relationships and the fact that Russia's on sale right now. And, um, and that creates some confusing trade patterns. Um, but what we do see very clearly um, is that trade in all directions is rising, which I take as an exciting sign that the Central Asian states are finally getting into place the pieces they need to normalize trade, which has never been normalized since the collapse of the Soviet Union. No, that is a very heartening trend. I'm glad you ended on that point. I Just one last quick question for our panelists before we open up, since we have such a large number of questions. Kasia, I'm wondering if you can just make a comment, you know, Teresa was bringing up about, you know, Evidence shows that upwards of a million Russians have left since the full-scale Russian invasion. It was in the two waves, and a great majority of them have gone to former Soviet republics. Uh, 
what has been, how have the Russian nationalists, to the extent you have any, and I'm not sure if you've got any data collection on this thus far, but how have the Russian nationals who've left Russia on account of the war and the possibility of conscription um, been received in Central Asia? And particularly, how have their presences impacted the cities in which they've settled, since we know they've gone to certain locations? Thanks, Jennifer. So we had a small section in our survey asking about refugees from Russia, or relicants, or uh, conscripts. Uh, so uh, we asked, for example, have the um, Russian citizens lately been immigrating to your area? So it's very important to understand that it is. we are asking about their area. If the city is small, like Dushanbe or Bishkek, then people are going to notice more of this uh, immigration than it's in a bigger country. So uh, even taking into account even that, we see that um, Kazakhstan, is a leader like uh, of receiving the uh, Russian uh, refugees. Um, um, I think it's obvious, but it, actually it, it is also shown in our public survey data. Then it goes Kyrgyzstan and also then Tajikistan and only then Uzbekistan. But maybe it is also linked to the uh, um, geography, like how big is the geography and proximity of Russians immigrating. And we also had a question asking, um, what was the impact of Russians immigrating to their area on different spheres of life? For example, we see a lot of concern about the pricing for housing and also for basic necessities, uh, but we see a more favorable uh, attitude towards uh, the increase of um, service uh, quality of the services. So we know that in Kyrgyz Kyrgyzstan in Tajikistan, there is this narrative that Russian coming to their country actually increases the quality of different services because they are bringing in skill. Uh, but we don't see it in Kazakhstan. Um, yes, and also we also asked about uh, how does this influence the um, um, crime situation in their area? And people generally answered that it doesn't have any influence on the crime in their countries. So. Oh, great. Thank you, Kasia. And again, as you show, like the data points, sometimes they're conflicting in terms of what we would think our assumptions would be, right? And that's why it's so excellent to have you give the number and then explain where you think the rationale for it is. I am going to, we've got 25 questions that have come in from the audience. So we're not probably going to be able to get through all of them. So I'll just, but I would like to get through as many as possible. So I will open up the floor, ask the questions, and then any of our participants can take them, but maybe give a shorter answer than you would otherwise, just so we can get through a greater number of them. First question that came in from, and encourage other audience members as well to send in your questions if you'd like. Uh, Nigel Lee at Georgetown University, regarding U.S. engagement with Central Asia after the C5 plus U.S. summit, what more should Washington do beyond the securitization of, quote, critical minerals? And would not the prioritization of critical minerals not perpetuate the extractive institutions of the region? Anyone can feel free to jump in and answer. It is a dirty industry to refine, to, to process uranium, to build fuel rods. But right now, Kazakhstan already leads the world in extracting uranium, which is a very dirty business. Um, I think it's worth at least considering that uh, to to industrialize that more, to bring in Western, um, possibly Chinese, but preferably Western investors. Um, you're right. For Central Asia to remain dependent on commodities is not an ideal outcome, and I don't think it's the only one. Um, but I'm the energy person, and I think the next mm -hmm. generation of energy, as far as Central Asia sees it, is going to involve um, the fact that they are large holders of the world's uranium. Excellent. A uh, question from Akmal Musafarov. One of the ways to counter Russian negative influence in Central Asia is to actively work with local civil society, which, which is uh, practically the only liberal-minded layer among the population. But using the example of Uzbekistan, we see that foreign NGOs are reluctant to work with local communities. Basically, they have one or two permanent partners, which are used for mutual embezzlement of grant funds. They don't do real work. The same is observed in other activities. Do you think it's possible to somehow change the situation? So basically, how what, what would be a counter to existing Russian influence? Do you see a, a mechanism that would be tenable? 
if I may jump in here. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, it is an important question, but the reason here is not in um, how Western um, agencies or organizations are dealing with their counterparts in Central Asia, but rather why there is the situation inside Central Asia that uh, there are no much NGOs available and um, uh, the um, whole area is uh, being monopolized by a couple of um, NGOs that have a great record of uh, cooperating with international organizations. I think uh, here Central Asian authoritarian regimes are um, shooting in their own legs because um, um, they you know, uh, the same thing can be said about the media consumption, for example. Um, uh, Central Asian authoritarian regimes want to control their own society, want to control what they're con consuming, want to control um, how civil society works, um, and want to be monitoring all of the NGOs that exist inside um, their own countries. And because of that, uh, there is just a very limited amount of people and organizations that, um, you know, survive in this um, circumstances. And because of that, we don't uh, see much of them. And we have this, this problem. I think uh, the main reason here is in um, authoritarianism, but not in kind of bad approach of the Western counterparts. Thank you, Timur. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, another question we have from Michael Keyes. Um, I've seen analysis of the January 2022 intervention of CSTO troops in support of President Tokayev to the extent that this was rather, quote, pre-cooked and meant to show Russia's reliability to a CSTO member than actually putting down an attempted coup. What do our speakers think about this? And how important are the Central Asians to the Eurasian Economic Union? Is the EEU still viable? Or is it basically a Potemkin village with not much there there? Thank you. I can take this one, or at least the first part of it. I think certainly the CSTO intervention was, I think, largely symbolic. I think many people, when it took place, expected it to be a more extensive intervention and the intervention was very short and the you know the, the forces basically secured some critical infrastructure and then departed within a matter of days so i think it was largely symbolic i think it signaled um to the population that dokhayev you know was going to be able to stay in power i think what happened in bloody january was a very complex series of events that we still because of the opaque nature of the regime don't really understand exactly what happened and there were certainly multiple layers including peaceful protesters including those who were trying to capitalize on this to, to loot and and take a personal advantage and then some political intrigue that was certainly happening behind the scenes and so i think i don't think this was in some way staged to prove the CSTO's existence, but certainly it did have the effect of signaling that the CSTO was able to have an effective intervention. And so I think it certainly did have that effect. In terms of the EU, I think most analyst, analysts would conclude that it is largely a political rather than an economic project. It certainly has proven useful to Russia to have those very limited um, customs controls with Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan because you know a large explanation for the uptick in trade that we saw between Central Asia and Russia which up increased 20% in 2022 was this re-export of goods primarily from China but also from elsewhere um, primarily through those EEU members so I think it's certainly proven um, useful to Russia in that regard. Thank you Edward. Um, next question, most likely directed at Teresa from Samuel Rottenberg. How do you assess the risk of Russia shutting down the Caspian pipeline for more than a few days, like in 2022? Would Russia or Iran try to stop a Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, or Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan pipeline across the Caspian? So I think that Russia will intervene in small ways to demonstrate that it can. But I think that uh, Russia doesn't want to lose um, its role as Kazakhstan's transit state. I think that when they damage deliberately or accidentally, but then fail to repair um, pipelines between Turkmenistan and Russia, that was the point at which a very fearful regime decided it was time to give up on that and throw their lot in with China. So I don't think I think that Russia 
plays with it with it at the margins, but doesn't want to use that role as transit state, so they will play carefully at the margins. Great. A uh, question from Emily Couch. Are Central Asian governments, oops, lost the question here. Are Central Asian governments in step with their populations when it comes to relations with Russia? I'm wondering to what extent government policies in this regard are increasing or decreasing their domestic popularity given the change in societal attitudes indicated in the Central Asia barometer. So maybe towards you, Kasia. Yes, I think my answer will not be full, but I hope other colleagues may join. Um, I think that public opinion, most people think that in authoritarian countries, the public opinion research is not necessary because it doesn't matter. The governments, they don't um, pay attention to it or use it, or they don't adjust their policies based on the public opinion. But um, we see a lot of um, attempts of the governments. Uh, when you watch, for example, national TV, they try to show uh, that they are actually popular that uh, they want to shape this perception of public opinion in their country that the leader is actually very popular and uh, from our experience we see that uh, for example Sadr Jabbarov used Central Asia Barometer data in his election campaigns so uh, public opinion is important definitely important but I think the question is uh, to what degree they actually can um, use it. Uh, I Maybe I can give you a small example. Before joining the uh, customs union, um, I was in a group of students who protested against, against joining the customs union. And we were actually said by some insiders that actually um, uh, this protest was um, favorable for the government because they will use this protest to um, in their negotiations with Russia to get more uh, gains because they will show that they have this domestic uh, protest against the customs union. So it is very important, but it is very complex. I think maybe someone else can jump in as well. I mean, I think that was a great answer, Kasia. Um, and just looking at the number of other questions we have coming in here, which is excellent. I'll move to the next question from um, Christian Wershitz, the chief correspondent of Austrian TV based currently in Kyiv. How much uh, is the war in Ukraine still a topic in the headlines in the media in Central Asia? In Austria, Germany, and other countries, the war between Israel and Hamas has very much replaced the war in Ukraine. I think this is something a lot of people will be interested in. To what extent is it still a focal point? Are our, our perceptions moving? I think I can jump in just for a comment. Um, we want to, in the next ways, we want to learn the public's attitudes towards Ukraine, taking into account that majorities in Central Asia, they support Palestine. Uh, Palestine's case while Ukraine is uh, supporting Israel and we would be really interested to see how the perceptions of Ukraine changed after learning their stance on the conflict so yeah but I think in media it it, it has quite replaced but uh, based on our spring data of course it is quite outdated, but we also saw there that the amount, the share of population who, who doesn't pay any attention to the conflict, uh, to the war, is gradually increasing. And it happens to any conflict that from time um, it decreases. So I think if I can Excellent. just very briefly add on this one, um, I think the because of the political um, because of the political nature of the relations between the regimes in Russia, of course, there's been a sensitivity, particularly in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, around allowing too much coverage. And so it's not featured particularly prominently in those two media spaces that are much more controlled. Um, and obviously, it's not, not mentioned at all in Turkmenistan. And then I think, secondly, um, and related to that, um, you know, I think there. Um, yeah, there's, there's basically very limited coverage and there's an attempt to suppress um, so discussion. And then in terms of Israel and, and Palestine, we've been monitoring this as part of another project at Oxus. And there certainly has been a massive uptick in messaging 
um, particularly from you know channels that discuss religion, um, social media channels, and others related to Israel and Palestine. So I think it'll be interesting to see the survey data, but it's certainly again resonating with with the population, um, especially the more conservative elements of the population. Great, thank you both. We have a few questions that are kind of touching on you know beyond Russia, other neighbors in the region, what their influence might be depending upon if Russia's influence does increase or decrease. So I'm gonna take two of these questions and combine them and open it up again for anyone. So Andrew Watson, Department of State, South Central Europe, with the decline of Russian influence, will the PRC further increase its presence in the region, fill a gap? If any, what are some areas, economic, political security that you could see the PRC moving in on? And related to that question, um, Mitchell Pullman asks, Turkey, India, and other countries are also expanding their roles in Central Asia. How is this impacting Russia's ability to exercise influence in the region? So maybe just anyone, you know, broadly, whether it's China, whether it's Turkey, whether, some of the, 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 the greater regional players, do you see them moving in? If so, where and why, when, how? If I may jump in here. Um, to be honest, I don't think that um, in international relations, uh, there are the same exact uh, rules as in, uh, for example, um, I don't know, uh, arith arithmetics or physics, uh, where you have uh, one declining um, power, the other will automatically increase. Um, I think here is uh, the process is much more chaotic and Central Asian countries do not want um, to be in a position where um, they kind of replace one um, dependency on another. And that is why their main goal in uh, their uh, international relations is to diversify their tariffs as much as possible. And here, um, I don't think we have an answer that you know one country would be replaced by another. I think all relations with all countries that are interested in Central Asian matter from Central Asian perspective, and because of that, they will be trying to keep Russia uh, present. They will be trying to expand their relationship with China where possible and where it's not uh, bringing a lot of security concerns or concerns from the society. They will be also expanding their relationship with Turkey and letting Turkey into even sensitive uh, security um, cooperation uh, uh, spheres. So um, I don't think there there is a kind of um, yes or no answer here that one country will definitely be uh, more dominant. I think central, what Central Asian countries want is to have everyone coexisting in this territory. Excellent. Anyone yeah. else want to, yeah, please, I was going to say, anyone else want to jump in with talking about another Thanks. region? I also think here, um, I fully agree with Timur, and also I think that the country-specific differences should be taken into account when talking about Central Asia in general, because from our survey data, we see completely different um, images of their perceptions of different countries, like Kazakhstan different, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan different, um, but we see a very uh, big um, share of the population who has a very favorable attitude towards Turkey. So it's a leader in public, uh, in soft power, I think, across these three countries, the three Turkic countries. Uh, we see that uh, in Kazakhstan, China is more popular than Russia and more popular than United States, um, but the difference is not, is not much high. In Kyrgyzstan, we see Turkey as a leader, Russia coming the second, then China, and only than US. And Uzbek in Uzbekistan, we see that Turkey is not that much favorable compared to Russia. Russia comes first, then comes Turkey, then United States, and only then China. But it also always changes uh, the perceptions of China uh, because of its direct involvement and all these um, investments and everything is ha happening. Uh, the perceptions of China are rapidly changing from one wave to another wave. So I think it's very important to measure it uh, regularly and to make sure that we take into account the country-specific differences between these countries. Excellent. Well, we are almost at time. I'd like to ask maybe a couple people had questions that where they specifically said, you know, they would like to see all the different participants weigh in. So maybe again, come my two questions and if everyone gives their kind of, you know, 60 second to 90 second answer. So one of these question for all from Oksana Gabitulina. 
Do Central Asian states have any leverage over Russia? We usually discuss Kremlin's influence over Central Asian states, but do the regimes have any specific advantage lever over Russia and could have the ability to affect Russia's security, energy, economy, behavior? Again, so kind of flipping it, we tend to, as it's true, we tend to talk about, you know, Russia and Central Asia, but do we see any areas where Central Asia has influence over Russia? And then a similar one that was also directed at all the participants um, from Oleg Antonov, in what ways have Central Asian countries adopted multi-vector foreign policies, balancing relationships between global powers like Russia, China, and the West? What are the challenges and opportunities? So again, what power does Central Asia have or the various Central Asian states have with respect to its various policy, foreign policy partners? So anyone should feel free to jump in on any of those questions, just keeping the answers pretty short. I guess I can start very briefly. Um, certainly all the countries want to pursue these multi-vector foreign policies where they balance relations with multiple different centers of power in the world. I think Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are the two um, largest countries in the region by different metrics are the best placed to do so. Um, Turkmenistan's also through its permanent neutrality managed to um, have a relatively balanced portfolio. Of course, the, the smallest and and um, by many cases weaker states in the region, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, worse in a worse place to do that. But certainly, what they want to avoid is being caught up in great power competition and asked to choose a side, be it China, Russia, or the United States. And so we've seen in the diplomatic activities, they've hosted Putin, they've met with Biden, they've been in Germany, they met with the Gulf states, for the first ever meeting between the GCC and the C5. So they've certainly been attempting to balance all these different relations, but I think they're different. They're, they're placed differently in their ability to do so. Great, thank you. Timar, I think you would put your hand up at the exact same time as Edward. Did you wanna add a follow-on comment? Yeah, I would uh, wanted to really quickly answer uh, the the first question. Um, I would I would say that those same um, um, you know spheres where Central Asian countries depend on Russia are at the same time those spheres where uh, Central Asia um, uh, has uh, leverage over Russia. Uh, when we speak about migration, of course, Central Asian countries want to have Russia as a main destination for their labor migrants for economic and political reasons. But at the same time, uh, Russian economy cannot stably develop without the uh, migration uh, from Central Asia. And actually, Russian demographic um, cannot, uh, you know, uh, at least stay uh, the same as it is, according to the recent uh, numbers. Um, it needs the inflow of uh, uh, migrants uh, annually. Around 300,000 people should come to Russia so that Russian population wouldn't decline. Um, at the same time, uh, trade also works in, in, in two ways. So um, if Russia uh, buys, for example, agricultural um, products from Uzbekistan, it doesn't mean that only Uzbekistan um, uh, gains something from it. It's also uh, something that Russia, um, you know, um, in, in a certain way depends on. So um, I would say that all of the um, things that we were discussing uh, when talking about the dependency of Central Asia can be turned upside down. Thank you. Thank you, Timur. Teresa, yeah. Oops, you're still muted, Teresa. Just to echo something Timur said, um, sometimes the areas of dependency are the areas of vulnerability as well. One of the reasons trade has increased in the region is because the more Russia is sanctioned, the more essential these neighboring states become for it to be able to engage in trade at all. And remember, the Eurasian Economic Union, Russia has been under sanction in larger and smaller ways ever since the beginning of this union. So one of the critical things that Central Asia does is, is Central Asia is the routes, it's the re-export, um, it's the markets. They always dreamed that Russia would be a huge market for them. That hasn't turned out to the trade hasn't turned out to be as advantageous to them as that but it has been very advantageous to russia russia is very sensitive to um, any suggestion that kazakhstan is going to enforce sanctions differently um and that's not just the pride in its own neighborhood that has to do with it it really is an important lifeline if you will for trade routes <clears throat> and then um i would also say keep in mind this differs in terms of the multi-vector policies, differs by country. Um, the old adage, adage is, if you don't border on Russia, it's easier to like it. But if you don't border on China, 
China's investments in you will be more mischievous. So, so China thinks hard about stability on its borders and the investments that they make tend to be wiser the closer you are to China. Whereas bordering with Russia is, um, is a huge risk factor. It's much easier if you're in Tajikistan to understand the advantages of a relationship with Russia than it is if you actually border on, on the territory. Thank, thank you, Teresa. And Kasiat, I will give you the final word. Any concluding comments you want to make? Yes, I actually fully agree with the colleagues. Um, it was a great honor and a pleasure to be in this panel. And I will be happy to answer any questions from the audience. Please uh, send us emails. Uh, I can send you the presentation with the data because I think most of my talk was about the numbers and many <laughs> They may, they may miss it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for those concluding. I think a lot of people actually would be interested to see the data points that Central Asia Barometer is coming out with. So with that, we are at time. Unfortunately, we did not get to all the questions, but I'm so appreciative of all the audience members that did submit questions and also very appreciative of our guests. So Edward Lemon, Teresa Sabonis Health, Timur Umorov and Kasia Ismanova. So thank you very much for enlightening us with the discussion. And thank you all out there for joining us for this afternoon's discussion. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.